All right. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another presentation for the R4DS Book Club Cohort 9. Um, I'm Ken Vu, and today I'll be presenting some slides for Chapter 11 of the R4DS book, which covers, which, which for today we'll be covering Chapter 11 on exploratory data analysis. So to give you all a little summary of what we're going to be talking about as we go through this chapter, we're going to be focusing on the on the following. We're going to learn about the two types of questions that are pretty useful to ask yourself whenever you're looking within your data, such as what type of variation occurs within my variables and what type of covariation occurs between my variables. We'll also explore the variation within the variables of your observations. Thirdly, we'll deal with outliers and missing values in your data, which we're going to learn in this chapter. Fourthly, we'll also explore the covariation between the variables of your observations. And then finally, we'll recognize how models can be used to explore patterns in your data. So before we move on with the chapter, even though we probably you probably may have seen these terms before in the previous chapters are for DS, like such as in chapters one, two, three, or four to five and six, I thought it'd be nice to give a quick review of all these important terms that are important to know when you're doing analysis with your data. That way we're all on the same page on what we're describing. So some of these definitions and words that are important to know include variable, which is essentially a quantity or quality or a property that you can measure. It's usually in the spreadsheet, it's usually a column that they use to measure something. So let's say you want to measure the height, how tall somebody is. Height is an example of a variable. It's something that you're measuring, like how tall a person is. And next up, you have value, which is the state of a variable when you measure it. That can change. Essentially, all these different unique values that reflect a certain variable or quantity you're measuring. So let's say, for example, my height is 5 feet and 9 inches. Or, yeah, so that's an example of value. It's a number that that is representing a, a, ver so, so a variable, value of a variable, or different values of that. So that's what a value is. And then an observation are a set of measurements that are made under similar conditions, one value per variable. So observation could be essentially each, in say you're doing a medical experiment on a bunch of patients. So an observation would be referring to all these combination of numbers or values that go with a particular individual, whether it be a person or, or an object or something along those lines. So in say a medical experiment involving patients, observation could be, you know, the, the measurement of their height or weight or blood pressure for this particular patient. Or in, in a general sense, you could say patient. So that's an example of an observation. Something that represents all these different unique combination of values made under similar conditions. And then next up, you have tabular data, which are observations of variables. So tabular data, you can think of it as like a table. So in the previous chapters, you've learned about tidy data and tables. So when you work with a spreadsheet where you have all these different cells and boxes where you put in information values. That's tabular data. It's essentially like this rectangular shape that you use to organize your data and hold information. And then you have tidy data, which is a way of how you arrange different values where you follow th these particular rules where every single column represents a variable, every row represents an observation, and then each cell represents a, a is a place where you can put values in there. And there certainly are different ways to arrange tidy data, depending on what kind of questions you're answering or what whatever project you work on requires. But generally, tidy data follows these set of rules where it's just one observation per row, one variable per column, and one value per cell. So just to give you an example, let's look at some data sets. So. I'm in my R studio right now. 
and I'm going to load the tidyverse library. And let's look at an example of a data set that helps you kind of explain some of the definitions I gave you. So let's say, for example, empty cars, which is a built-in data set in R. So empty cars. So going back to our vocabulary, an example of a variable would be something like this. So this variable, MPG, is a variable that measures miles per gallon for each of these cars. So that's an example of a variable. It's usually something that you use to measure a certain category of values. So in this case, we're measuring miles per gallon. How, you know, the mileage of the car, like how many miles they can go per gallon of gas. So that's an example of a variable. And value are all these individual numbers that represent different that different number or pieces of information for this particular variable. So 21 is an example of a value, as well as 22.8, all these different values. They're all different numbers, but they all are part of the same type of information, in this case, miles per gallon. And then you have observation, which represents all these combinations of different numbers for a particular. So for example, this row here has the miles per gallon, the number of cylinders, and the horsepower for this type of car. That is an observation. They're all these, they all have the same columns, as you can tell, but the numbers that they have for each of these columns are different. So observation refers to all these unique combination of different values. So in this case, all these numbers here belong to this, this Mazda RX-4, this type of car. And then all these numbers here, which are kind of different, belong to Mazda RX-4 WAG, and so on and so forth. So that's an example of an observation. And this here is tabular data. You see how it's kind of arranged like a table, where it's sort of like in this block format, like rectangle. And it's and this data right here is tidy because each of these columns here are all representing different variables with miles per gallon, the weight of the car, and so on. And then each row represents a set of observations. In this case, each op row represents these different values for miles per gallon for each of these different cars, types of cars. And then here are the values, the number that goes with this variable and then goes with this particular observation. In case, the, this miles per gallon for this particular car. So that's just a, a little review of some general definitions that are important to know. Now, even though we covered them before in the past, it's good to kind of review it so that way we're all on the same page here. As throughout this book, they're going to be using these same kind of terms, and it's important to make sure that you're familiar with these definitions when talking about tidy data and doing any kind of data analysis. All right. So moving on, now that we kind of have our definitions in, in place, let's go into particular aspects of exploratory data analysis, which as a quick review, exploratory data analysis is this process in which you explore your data, looking for patterns and trends and, and not analyzing them using a variety of different charts or statistical tables or data tables and all kinds of these numbers as a way to understand how does what does the data look like? Are there any patterns or trends that you can see in the data? And what could that tell you about this, whatever you're trying to study or do an experiment on? So that's a little bit about exploratory data analysis. And going into this part of chapter 11, variation, one of the things about exploratory data analysis is that when you're looking at data or looking at trends, one of the things that you, you need to be aware of is about variation, which is the tendency of values of a variable to change between measurements. As when you're plotting any kind of data, you might find patterns, or you might find that when you plot a certain set of variables, you might see some interesting trends here that might indicate something is going on with the data. And as a quick review of what category of variable are, remember that category categorical variables are as you can see, we'll see here are essentially variables that only take certain values or 
where each value represents maybe a certain group or a category or a level. And a good way to show that is with this plot, where we use the diamond set to show, to get a count of how many diamonds have these different cuts. So anyone who doesn't know about diamonds, so cut is a variable that refers to how well the diamond is cut and shaped and formed with the rating system from fair to ideal being the highest. So you see here in our scatter plot, in our histogram, which you can create using this command here, which I'm gonna run in our studio. Hold on a second. Which you can run in our studio. You see here that you can kind of see that there is sort of a, some variation here, where as the cut gets better, we have more and more diamonds. And you see here, cut is an example of a category variable because each of these values, fair, good, very good, premium, and ideal, they all represent different groups or different levels or different groups that you can sort these value, these observations into. So each of these diamonds are sorted into these different groups. So fair, good, very good, and ide ideal and premium. And this kind of graph here is a histogram, which allows you to, or actually no, it's a bar chart, where it's, it allows you to get a frequency or basically just how many of a certain observation are based on which category they're in. And you can see here how, you know, as the cut gets better, there's a lot more diamonds as well. So there's a bit of variation or different in the data and maybe some trends here, as you can see here. Now, that's just an example of what you can do with categorical variables. There's also a different type of variable that you can plot as well and explore. And this type of variable is called continuous variables, which are variables that can take on a variety of different numbers. Usually, if you want a, a quick way to think about it, you can think of it as a variable that can take decimals. Because before, you know, with um, categorical variables, it only takes a certain set of values, where it's, I could either be fair, good, very good, premium, or ideal. Like it cannot be any other value. With continuous, it could be a variety of values. It can be decimals and fair and a half. <laughs> and that, that could work though. <laughs> that, <that's... laughs> yeah, I just got a comment about fair and a half. It's just about categories. But but yeah, but in generally, um, categorical variables, there's a set of values that it can only be. <laughs> so yeah, it makes me wonder why like there's no in between for how good a cut is, but that's a question for the diamond cutters for sure. But anyway, um, for continuous variables, as I said, it can take on a variety of numbers. It could be decimals or even just fractions and so on and so forth. And you can also ver visualize them with the histogram. So going back to ggplot, we can do it as a histogram where if you plot it, you essentially get sort of like a bar chart, except it's a very different kind of bar chart and called a histogram, where a histogram, what it does that it allows you to get a sense of how the distribution of the data, depending on a certain variable, usually a continuous one. And you can see here that for this variable caret, that we do have a high concentration of values that are around here. As what a histogram does is that it separates this data, usually numeric data, into a set of bins, where each bin has a certain range of values from a certain number to a certain number. Think of it as boxes to sort the data into. And you get a count of how many values fall into each of these bins. And you can see here that there's a lot of numbers that are between zero and one or zero to two. And you do have some numbers that don't fall within the gen where a lot of the values are, like some values that fall outside where the trend is right here. As most of the data is right here, well, you do have some numbers here. 
So, and that's something that histogram can show you just where the general content, where data is just generally concentrated around. And so that's kind of one of the ways that you could look at continuous variables when you're exploring your data set through histograms. Now, there are other options that you can use besides the histogram. There's also GM Freak Freak Poly, which is an alternative to histograms where instead of getting bars, you get a nice curve. Right? Because one of the things about this histogram is that it can kind of feel very blocky. And some people may not like that blocky look. So people want something more smooth, like a curve. And so you can, instead of a histogram, you can also do it using GeoMFreak and Poly to get just a, a, a curve instead. So we're going to go into R and basically, just as a small scale example, we're going to go to the diamonds data set. And what we're doing is we're only getting the diamonds where the carrot is less than three. And we put it into this, this object smaller, and then we'll plot this as a, as hit plot this where, a second, wait, let me, Hold on a second, let me fix this. And so we're gonna plot it, right? Wait, hold on a second, let me, so you're gonna plot this with jump freak poly. And instead of the bars, you get a nice little curve, get some curves here, where instead of bars, you have sort of a line that connects all of these different bins together. So. And then we can also change the color to reflect the cut as well. So we get all these different curves that reflect the, the cut. So you can see here we that we have sort of like a different set of curves depending on the cut here. And we can see there that we that a lot of the ideal diamonds are have sort of a carrot that's about zero to one with a couple, like say premium, it's kind of a bit scattered between zero to one and some of them are between one and two and so on and so forth. So that's just another way you can look at continuous data. It's through um, these density, these, um, you get all these um, density curves where instead of getting histogram, these bars, you can have a nice curve that connects all these bins together in a nice little curve. So that's just another way you can go about it besides histograms. And now, now that I've showed you some visualization, it's important to remember that you know part of data analysis isn't just creating all these wonderful visualizations, which are nice to look at and help you make sense of the data. But you have to remember that one of the purpose of visualization is to explore your data and really think about what the data is trying to tell you or what can you learn from the data. And so when you're making visualizations, it's important to think about the following questions as you try to explore your data and try to make sense of it. And some of these questions are, which of these values are the most common and why? Which values are rare? Why does it match what you expect? Can you see anything unusual about the data? And what might explain what you're seeing in the data? There certainly are a lot more questions, but these are some things that are important to think about when you're looking at your data set. Because visualizations are a way to help you look at it, especially when you have so much information to look at. So it's important to kind of think about these questions as you explore data which will not only help you what to look at, but also what kind of visualization that you need to answer these questions for sure, right? So as we move on, there's also other options that you can employ when you're looking at your histograms. And one of the options that you have is that you can change the bin width, basically the size of these little, basically how wide are these bars that, that you saw earlier? 
because by default it just pick divides the by default the number of bins is about as i would say 30 and then it divides them or just whichever is appropriate for the data and then it divides the data into an appropriate set of bars that have a certain fixed length and so you can actually control how big the bins are by making this argument bin width to and set it to whichever bin size you like how wide the bins are so going back yeah I was just gonna say like the bins. I think I've heard of people like I guess it means the same thing, like calling them like buckets. Like if you want you have numbers like one to a hundred and it's like you want them in buckets like zero to five, or you could do buckets from zero to ten or zero to fifty, kind of just mm -hmm. how you want them the observations together, kind of thing. Yeah. Or yeah. values rather. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Like bins are yeah, like yeah, thank you for clarifying that for sure. Yeah. So yeah, you can think of bins as sort of like buckets, like where they each represent interval like zero to hundred or a hundred to two hundred, something like that. Yeah, that's essentially what bins are. You break them up into all these different boxes that cover different ranges, and you sort the values into each of them. So here I'm going to geom histogram, and we do the same thing like we did before up here. However, I'm gonna to go to bin width and then change it to 0.01 essentially make the bin smaller. And you can see here, you get sort of a similar histogram that we got earlier, except now there's a lot more bins. You see a lot of these bars, it looks much slightly wider because now we've made the bin small, smaller. So there's, there's a bunch of these bars, more of these bars. And so that's just one option that you have if you want to have more control over how the histogram looks. And as you're playing around with histograms, um, it's important to kind of look at some questions, uh, other questions as well, when you start splitting the data into these smaller groups, or especially as like we did earlier, where we separate these curves into, they have these different curves based on the cut. And some of these questions include, how are these observations which each cluster similar to each other? As in, when you're separating these based on a category, does the data behave a little bit differently depending on the category? And then another one is, how are these observations in separate clusters different from each other? How can you explain or describe the clusters? Or what might the appearance of clusters be misleading? And these are important questions to ask as sometimes when you, like for example, by default, when you're separating a data based on their group, it's a it, you might it's important to know that it might have an impact on how the data shows up or you might find like as we saw here that the the range of values for the carrot kind of changes a bit best based on the cut where you have ideal you have a huge number of them that are between zero to one and and then you have premium where you have some of them around here someone around here somewhere around here and so these are kind of these questions down here are sort of there to kind of help you guide you as you start looking at your data and what you might look at as you start creating these visualizations. So, and other than that, there's also other important tips to know as well, such as using chord Cartesian to zoom in to see unusual values. So, so a good example is um, if you if you go into GG plot and you go to your diamonds data set and and you use core Cartesian on the histogram you'll find that <clears throat> that core Cartesian allows you to kind of essentially just plot all these bars in relation to the actual range of values for this data set. Because by default, the histogram just kind of goes off of, essentially based on the number of bins and how you're sorting it. But here, every little, it basically plots something for every little 
tick mark within this range of values. So that's another way if you want to kind of widen it and get a wider view of the data, which is good if you want to spot any unusual values. So you can see here in this wider histogram, you, you, you see you have an outlier here and some, some, some number of points that are around here and around here. So that's just an extra tool if you want to catch more unusual numbers that are not where most of the data points are. Sure. And, and another, if you go back, sorry, yeah. what was the, what was the, um, can I see the thing? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 It's another, it's another variable, I think, in the data set. Yeah. Okay. And then another tip that I think it's important to know is that it's okay to drop some some unusual values. So if you see any numbers that are outside of the typical range of values that you're seeing, it's okay to drop them, especially if you know where they're coming from or why they're where they are. As it's a general rule of thumb that that when you that you typically don't want to drop outliers, as sometimes they can help explain about what's going on in the data, and if you, Unless, of course, it does affect the analysis, then in which case you drop them. But usually in that case, you, you still want to tell people you drop them and then explain why and where they might be coming from. As even these observations can tell a story about what might be going on in the data. You know, these are just some tips to consider when you're looking through your data. All right, so next up, as I kind of alluded for, Sometimes when you explore your data, you might run into the issue of missing numbers. Sometimes when you're working with data set, you might find that some numbers might be missing, they're not there, or the data might be so horrible that it's hard to read them or be able to plot them. And, and this is something I imagine that people would probably would find in a real world data set, as sometimes data is not always clean. And while it can be a bit of a struggle to figure out how to do it, R thankfully has options to deal with these missing values or unusual values. And one of the ways to go about it is to drop the entire row, which is something that might not be a good idea in practice as for there are, as when you drop a row, you're not only getting rid of that missing value, you're also getting rid of the other values that are associated with that row. So you might end up losing a lot more information that way. Even if like you have a bunch of columns where there's missing data. So it, so that's something that you can do. Another option is to also replace the bad data with NA. NA meanings like not applicable or like just indicating that there's missing. And one of the ways to go about it is to use dplyr, this function mutate which allows you to here, especially in this case, where you go into diamonds, where you, you can use the if else function, where given a certain condition, you can tell it what value is that, that column given this condition. And then otherwise, if that condition is not met, what do you return? So in this case, we have it where if y is less than three or y is greater than 20, we put NA. Otherwise, you just return the original value. So that's just another way you can clean it, where you can set some bad data with NA and then have that kind of fix the column that way. So we're going to run this. Which will clean up the data and get rid of these values that are meeting this condition and make them NAs. So that's just one option that you can use. And as a heads up, um, whenever you're doing any plotting with missing data, you, you might find that ggplot will give you a warning when those values are missing. So, and one of the, any case that you don't want those warnings to show up, one way to do that is that Whenever you're doing some kind of dplyr operation, like mutate or even 
or even select and all that, or even doing summaries statistics, you can always add in this argument na dot remove true, which will allow you to suppress, allow you to remove any NAs that you find, and essentially kind of get rid of them. So these are some of the options that you can use when you're dealing with missing data, which allow you to continue working with the data with less risk of any issues that you might run into due to missing data or even bad data specifically. All right, next up, we have the topic of covariation, which I kind of mentioned at the beginning. And covariation, to explain it, is, is basically when you have the values of different variables changed together in some way, where if you change the value of this variable, you, you, can, exp you can have the, the value of another variable ends up changing a certain way as well. So that is covariation. And, and this is another thing to, that you want to look for when you're doing exploratory data analysis, where the, whether or not there's significant covariation in your data. And, and it's possible to visualize this, though. But the way you visualize it depends on the types of variables that you're trying to plot. And it depends on these cases. So in the case of, say, you have one variable that's categorical, meaning you have groups, and then continuous where you just have a set of numbers, including decimals. There's a way to plot this kind of variable, and I'll show you. And one way to do it is with the geom box plot. So as an example, let's say for the diamonds data set, I want to see for each cut of the diamond, I want to see price, see the range of values for price, and then do a box plot. So a little bit about the box plot. The box plot, essentially what it does is that it allows you to separate the data into these different box, box and whisker objects, where each of these boxes here, they all kind of represent sort of the range of values for values in this category. And then the the tail is kind of helping you to indicate, I guess, the range of values that fall outside of these, these quartiles, which, and with these points here kind of representing outliers, any points that are outside the general trend of where most of the numbers are. And then this black line here represents the median, like the middle number, the number in the middle, where if you take all these numbers and you sort them from smallest to largest, the median would usually be the number in the middle. And then the end of this box here represents quartiles, essentially parts of the data where if you sort them from small to, to the largest, this first quart, this quartile here, quartile one, kind of basically saying, this quartile one saying that at this point, this is, I know for sure that 25% of the data is smaller than this number, and then the 75% of the data is greater than this number. And then this median, essentially 50% of the numbers, when I sort them from small to big, is below this number and then 50% above it. And then this quartile three, meaning when you sort them from small to largest, 75% of the data is below this number and the 25% is above it. So that's just kind of a brief explanation of what it's showing. So essentially it just shows you the spread of the data depending on the category. So yeah, that's so that's one way you can look at it, especially if you have a case where you have one continuous variable and one categorical. So box blocks are kind of a way for you to look at your data that way when you have those kind of variables. And now what if in the case of you have two categorical variables where it's where unlike the box plot where you had a continuous variable, you now have another categorical. Well, thankfully, um, ggplot has a type of graph for that. And this plot is called geom count, where essentially what you have is where, let's say, for example, in the diamonds data set, I want to see the cut and also see the color of the diamond. 
I don't want to plot them. And one of, and if you're and one of the ways we can plot them is with geom count, where essentially what it does is that for each combination of categories, we get the number of diamonds that are in this group. So this, so you can see here that we have all these different dots where the size of the dots change depending on the number of observations that fall within these combination of categories. So for example, so this dot here represents diamonds that are of co this color D and of this cut fair, this fair cut. And the size of this dot reflects the number of diamonds that are of the color D and are have a fair cut. And you can see how the size of the dot of these dots change depending on how many diamonds fall within this category and the category type of color here. So that's just one way you can plot two category variables. Now, there's also a way that you can do this. And one of the ways you can go about it is to do some data wrangling, where if you want to get the counts of the number of diamonds that fall within each combination of categories. There's a way you can manually do it. And one of the ways you can do it is by go to diamonds and then group by cut and color. Basically, what it does is that it groups all the observations together where First, we group them by cut. So all the diamonds that are fairly cut are grouped together first, and then all the diamonds that are cut, you know, good in a very good way are grouped together, and then so on and so forth. And then once we sort that within each cut, we also sort by color as well. And then once you do all that, we then summarize where we get a count of how many diamonds fall within each different combination of categories. And so when you run this, you can see here for each combination of values where we have this category fair, and then for each of these colors, we get different counts for how many diamonds fall within each of these combination of categories. So for fair and then of color D, we have 163, fair and color E, we have 224, and so on and so forth. And then you can also do this very quickly by using count, where instead of having to do all this group by and summarizing, you can also do diamonds and then count. And then you specify the categories that you want to get all these special counts for. So you want to get the count for cut and color. So same result as up here. It's just one line. It's just um, one function doing it instead of separating it into two different functions. So that's just another option that you have. Right? And with that in mind, Remember earlier that I showed you the geom count, which allows you to plot two categorical variables. There's also another way to plot this kind of data, and one of them is the geom tile, where I use this summary table here, and I can plot it with geom tile, where like before, I set my two category variables, and and then I also have to set the fill, basically what I'm filling with. In this case, I set it to n, which is essentially the number of diamonds within each combination of categories. So when I plot it, you get these colorful tile where the shade of the color reflects how many diamonds that are in that category. So the darker the shade of blue, the less diamonds that are in this category. So you can see here, we don't have a lot of diamonds that are fairly cut and of color D. And then you can see here, say this one right here, that the, the lighter the color, the more diamonds we have. So in this case, diamonds that are color G and that are ideal, there's a lot of them here. Which does make sense as you go back to here, we do have a very big circle here. So that, there, there are quite a lot of diamonds here. So that makes sense. So that's another kind of colorful way you can express two categorical variables, especially when you have two categorical. So that's another way you can go about it, where you can use color to express counts instead of using circles and sizes. Lastly, you have another case 
what if you have two continuous variables where both variables can typically hold decimals? For this case, you have a number of options. You have, the first of them is geom point, which when you set it up, let's say for example, for diamonds, I want to measure, we basically plot the carrot and also get the price of e of the diamond based on the carrot. So if I pl plot this, you get a scatter plot with using geom point, where okay, where if I plot it, you get a nice spread of points where every single pl pl point here represents a diamond. So here we have. Each point represents the diamond in terms of the carrot as well as the price. And you can see here, you, you get your usual scatter plot, sort of similar to the ones that we've seen before in chapter three. So that's just one way you can plot it. Some people might not like this because you can see here that depending on your data, all these data points are bunched up. And sometimes it can be kind of hard to get some specific information on where the data is concentrated. Because I look at the spot here, it's hard to tell how many points are concentrated around here because they're all bunched up together. I mean, I can zoom in, but with but when you're working with large data sets, it might not be possible because of just the high volume of points here. So one way you can summarize data, with that, especially involving two continuous variables, is you can also use this other function, bin 2 d which allows you to separate the points into a bunch of different bins, sort of like with histograms. And then when you plot it, you get it where you have a similar plot here to the scatter plot, except instead of having the individual points themselves, you have these boxes where the color here reflects basically how many points are in that area. So that's another way you can plot two continuous variables using geombin 2 d where you get the same data, except instead of getting this map up, this huge array of points, you basically divide the data up into boxes, and then you count the number of points that are around that area. So you can see here, the darker it is, the, the less points there are over here. And then the lighter the points are, the, the boxes are, the bins, the more points there are. So you can see here, there, there are quite a lot of points that are, are around here where the care is between zero to one and the price is less than 2,500, like somewhere around here, which confirms with, kind of confirms what we're seeing here. You can see how there's a huge amount of points here. And it's kind of hard to see because all the points are together, but this kind of shows that there are actually a lot more points here. It's just that they're so close together that it's hard to tell them apart. So this is a nice way to go about it, especially when you have a large spread of points all bunched up together. And you probably only might only care about how many, where mo the points are more concentrated. So that's one way. Now, I imagine some people may not like the boxes. And thankfully, ggplot2 has another way to plot this, where instead of having boxes, you can also have a nice different shape. So you can do this with geom hex, where Using the same example, we're going to use the diamonds, and then we'll have on the x-axis the carrot, and y being the price of the diamond, and use geom hex. Let's see what happens. And you can see here, you get the same graph as up here, except instead of boxes, you now have these nice you know, hexagons for the bins shape. So it's, it's just the same graph but the shape of the bins are different. And like before, the color represents how many points there are with here in this case, the darker, the, the hex, the less points there are over here. And then the lighter the points, the more points there are there. So definitely these are just some of the options that you have when you're plotting your data, depending on the kind of variables that you're plotting. There certainly are a lot more, but these are just some examples. Sure. Now, before we end, I do want to go back um, to categorical and continuous. 
as there's also another option for plotting one continuous and categorical. And one of those plots that you could certainly check out is the violin plot, which is something that's very similar to the box plot, except you also get a better sense of the distribution of the data. As one of the problems with box plots sometimes is that while you get a sense of where the data is concentrated, it's kind of hard to tell the shape of, you know, how the data is distributed just by looking at these boxes. And so if you want to get a better sense of the shape of the data, you can always use violin plots, where it shows the same data, except it also adds more information about how the data is distributed, how it looks like, kind of like with histograms. So you can do the same thing with the box, how you set up a box plot, where instead of box plot, you have geom violin, and then you plot that, you have the violin plot, where you, you probably don't quite see where the median is or all these quartile numbers are, but you do get a sense of how the data how the data is distributed. Where you can see here, there's a lot of um, prices for fair diamonds in this range, and then it kind of tapers off here. And then for for ideal, you have a lot of diamonds that are with this in this range, which could probably mean that there are a lot of diamonds that are less than two thousand five hundred here, and then it kind of have some interesting numbers that are fall outside this range over here. So here, you not only get to see range of values for price, depending on the cut, but you also get the sense of where the data is most concentrated. So it's essentially like a box plot, but it adds the information of how the data is distribu distributed. So you know where data is most concentrated based on the category. So there certainly are a lot more plots in this, but that that's um, another option that you have with when it comes to one continuous and one category. Did you say something? Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't remember if it was in the other book club, but someone was saying, or I don't know where, if it was in the other book club or if I read it somewhere, but how like the violin plot, it's like a mirrored density curve. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, so that was kind of interesting. So like, yeah, like a smooth line over a histogram and like the density curve. I was like, oh, oh, that's really cool. I mean, I already love violin plots, but it was pretty cool to think of it that way. Oh, definitely. You're you're right, though. Like, it's definitely a lot smoother, though, for sure, than this right here. Yeah. It's, it's like a histogram mixed into a box plot. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. All right. So this is the la definitely, I think it's, let's see here. So in this section right here for 11.6 there isn't really anything to show here but these are just some general things to note so so far in the chapter i told you about some that part of exploratory data analysis is to find patterns and so one of the things that it's important to note with all these visualizations is that when you're looking for patterns it's important to ask yourself kind of these following questions as a way to help guide your data analysis some of these questions are, could this pattern be due to coincidence, random chance? How can you describe the relationship implied by the pattern? There's also questions such as, how strong is the relationship implied by the pattern? What other variables might affect the relationship? And does the relationship change if you look at individual subgroups of the data? So these are questions that are important to ask when you're looking at your data and you see patterns, though. As visualizations, part of their purpose is to look at patterns and see if it can tell you something about the data and how it's behaving and whether it has to do with the data itself or questions you're asking, or it's just something that happens randomly. So that's those some things to think about when thinking about looking at patterns in your data and how to think about them. And lastly, this is just a minor note. Um, these are just some examples of ways you can simplify your code when writing ggplot. So when you're setting up um, ggplot, you know, functions and to do these graphs, there's ways you can write it this way. Uh, one of the first ways is to set up your ggplot function. 
where you specify what data set you're using, the mapping, essentially what gets plotted on the graph, and then use the plus sign to add, specify what kind of plot did you want. So in this case, you, you're getting a frequency plot, sort of like this curve. So that's just one way to go about it, where all the information is stored in ggplot, and then you add in what kind of plot you want. Another way you can write it is where 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 you just ignore where you can just ignore specifying data and just use positional arguments where when you, if you know the order of the arguments you can just ignore specifying data is equal to faithful and mapping equals that and that's only if you know the order of the arguments because with ggplot when you look at the documentation you first specify the data set and then the mapping and then in aes you specify uh, what variables get plotted, X, Y, and fill in color. So that's only if uh, you're really advanced and you really know the functions in and out. So that's one way you can shorten it. There's also another way too, where you have ggplot and then you just specify the data set and then you add on the AES separately outside of ggplot. And then you specify the kind of plot that you want. So. So this one can be a bit messy, but it's also another way you can write it. So there certainly are a lot more ways to write this, but the point is that when, when you're setting up your ggplot pipes, there are many ways you can go about it and it's a, and you don't have to do it a certain way. Just as long as that people can understand what you're doing and that you're able to get the result that you get. All right, so certainly um, this chapter isn't comprehensive, as as I said before. There are a lot of different types of graphs that are beyond what this book can cover. So if you're interested in, in looking into it more, there's certainly are different links that you can go into to check out all different types of graphs that you can plot. There's the RFDS book club. There's also this link here where you get some documentation about ggplot2, which I'll post in the chat. And then you also have the graph section in the R cookbook, which is essentially a set of recipes and tutorials on how to graph certain things in ggplot and how to take advantage of the customization of ggplot. So. So I'm going to put that in the chat. And with that said, that's the end of this presentation. So I want to say thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you all find this meaningful and hope you all stay tuned for the next book club. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.